I should. So it says like, hi, my name is Karen Einstein, and I'm with the independent publishers of New England this morning on our Thursday morning Ask the Experts broadcast. In this program, we speak with different experts in various areas of the field of independent publishing in New England. And today, we're very lucky to have with us Melissa Ludke, who's working on a fascinating project entitled Touching Home in China. It's a story of Basically, well, I'll let her explain it, but she adopted a wonderful woman from China as a nine-month-old baby 19 years ago, and it's kind of the story of the differences in China and the United States um, with that girl, but also the, the format of her project is incredible. It's transmedia. Melissa has um, 40 years of experience as a journalist. She started out working with Sports Illustrated in, uh, covering areas of baseball and basketball and then she moved from there to Time Magazine and she worked in areas of family and childhood development and then from there moved into the Neiman Reports which was fascinating for her as uh, it was the moment when journalism was beginning to switch from print into digital. Um, I'll let her speak more about uh, the various projects she's on. So welcome, Melissa. Very nice to have you here with us. Karen, thank you so much, and thank you, Charlotte, and uh, mm -hmm. thank everyone at IPNE for um, thinking of us uh, as part of your uh, weekly broadcast. I'm uh, I'm very touched by that, and um, feel very privileged to be with you. Okay, um, to start off, Melissa, it's hard to decide where to begin because this project is just incredible. It's I, it's something I hadn't really thought of before, the, the format that you're working in. Could you tell us a little bit about the timing, how you decided to work on this project and how you decided to finance it and, and how long it's been it's been going on? Well that's a lot of questions there. <laughs> yes. uh, let me take you back to the, uh, the vision for it. Um, the vision really came out of being a mother uh, of a daughter who was adopted uh, from China when she was nine months old, as you mentioned. And the reason that she was adopted is because she'd been abandoned as a baby girl. She was, uh, according to her records, three days old when she was abandoned in a uh, town, a rural town in China called Xiaxi Town, and taken to an orphanage. Uh, you can see on the screen there, my daughter is the one in the top row and she is second from the right and then next to her second in from the left is a girl named Jenny Jenny and Maya were in the orphanage together for nine months Jenny had been abandoned when she was a one-day-old baby in a town called Shishia Shu town uh, each was about 25 kilometers from the major city and um, they ended up both in the same orphanage and were adopted together in the same adoption group, became friends in childhood. So it was the idea and the vision, really, of that they shared of going back to their towns for the first time as teenagers, meeting the girls there to try to begin to have some understanding of what their lives might have been like growing up in 21st century rural China as a girl instead of growing up in 21st century America. So it's their story, their journey, their journey of discovery that we're really telling in this story. Okay, wonderful. And are you working with anyone else on this project? Are you doing it mostly with your daughter? Or? Well, my daughter is at college now, as is Jenny. They're both in school, and that is taking up considerable amounts of their time. So while they're always uh, willing to answer questions, I would say that they're no longer kind of uh, driving this project ahead, although they are willing conspirators in it. Um, I am working now with a documentary filmmaker based in the Boston area uh, named Julie Molossi. And Julie's uh, first documentary, I think she's now working on her sixth or seventh, uh, was actually her own return to China. Her uh, mother is Chinese, her father Italian, hence her last name. And so she had gone back really in a search to look at the roots of her mother's family in China. So right away we had some threads of connection there. 
But most importantly for this project, which we'll get into because it combines both my skill as a writer for print and my experience, her skill as a visual uh, storyteller through documentary film, we've now combined our two skills to really do this book. It's a book um, that's really a transmedia book. And so I, I'd love to get into a little bit more about that because really that's what you all are about is this creation of books and storytelling. So I'm happy exactly. to explore how we're working together to build this one. Okay, fantastic. And you've just led right into my next question. Great. Um, what is a transmedia book? Um, well, let's go back it? to the derivation of trans, which okay. anyone who's taken the SAT knows means across. <laughs> so it is really very simply telling stories across media. It is different than multimedia. Multimedia implies that you kind of just put media together in some way and part of it's going to do this and part of it's going to do that. In our case, we really are telling the story across a range of media. So when I went to China, the journalist in me, not the mother, but the journalist in me, said this might be a very, very important story to share with people. And so my mother had just passed away, and being an anthropologist, she had left a little bit of money. And I thought, what more would my mother want me to do with this money than to bring home a story, an anthropological story in some ways, about this cross-cultural meeting of girls whose lives began in the same town and then diverged dramatically. They would come together and we would be there to take video of it to who knows what end it was really about their journey and then secondarily if something could be made of it after their journey then we would so we I hired a bilingual bicultural video team of essentially three women and they were the ones who accompanied my daughter into uh, and, and Jenny into their villages into their wow. towns you can see that we have some stories coming soon. We're building this project. Um, and so it was when we got home, I had 90 hours of video. Wow, great. And how did you divide this? How did you organize it? Did you organize it chronologically? Did you organize it through your experience, through her experience, through topics? How did you organize the... Um the the book itself, the transmedia project. Well, you're, you're starting to see some of the organization here as, um, as Charlotte is showing our first story which is called Abandoned Baby. But I do want to back up because I came in with a very naive, very naive notion of this. I, I'd never done anything like this before. I didn't really even know such a, such a thought existed. But once Julie and I put our heads together and we thought, well, we have video. I have the skill set of writing. We have some photography from this place. We have documents. Um, so if we have these ingredients, what are ways that people are telling stories today? I really didn't feel like, uh, you know, in my early 60s that I wanted to learn how to do a documentary film. And frankly, Julie persuaded me that we didn't really have um, the material for a documentary film. We'd only been there for three weeks. And so out of our research came our discovery of what are called iBooks. Those are very distinct from eBooks, which most people are familiar with. Thanks for putting that up, Charlotte. These show you the four iBooks that we have done. This is on an Apple platform. You simply get literally I think it costs you like twenty dollars and you download an entire program which is called iBook Author and using this very sophisticated um, template uh, and developing it yourself because it gives you a lot of options about what to do with that we were able to start building a book so it's a book but it's <laughs> not really a book it's a book unlike any book I had ever seen or done before. You see here some screenshots from it. This is our second story. We call it our second iBook in the series of six called Touching Home. 
And you can see just to the right a little bit, that second screenshot, you can see in the middle of it a little circle with an arrow. And that tells you that right there on that page is a video. So you can see that as you're reading the book, you're not leaving that page to look at that video. That video is going to tell you more of the story than what you would have gotten um, just from my writing about it. So you can play that. You can expand it out to fill your entire, you know, say the iPad is the most <clears throat> optimal way to look at it. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly you're right in this story. You're immersed into the video moment wow. that is taking you to where we are, have gotten you in the text. Uh, you also see this next page where we're able to show you these girls. Well, when you get to this page, you're not just seeing their picture with their name. You touch that, and suddenly you are going to see come up on your screen on your iPad a description. You're going to learn about Chen Chen. You're going to learn about Yuan Mong Ping. You're going to find question. out what separates them mm -hmm. um, from each other, the different life stories that bring them to the point where these girls met. Okay, so, um, we just have a question that someone sent in, yeah. and that is, um, do you need the iBook for that, or can you do it on the website? You can do it on a website. I'm gonna. I'm. A, that's a great question. Talk about a question that puts us right in the bullet point of where we want to go. If you want to read it as an iBook, you have to download it through iTunes, and you can download it onto any Mac device. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was the dilemma. We found a wonderful, what we thought was an optimal platform to do it, but we realized that we were extremely restricted because not everyone has a Mac, certainly not everyone has an iPad. And what we've discovered is that people haven't discovered iBooks yet. So it's not a natural place that people go to find find something to read or engage with. So that's been a challenge. So okay. to overcome that, what we decided to do was that we needed to build a website to this okay. point exactly so that every story that we do as an iBook we are now putting up on a website where we were able to get funding from Mass Humanities uh, through their social media outreach grant program. They gave us the funding that we needed. We have coded from scratch a website. We are not using a template. We're not going to go to Squarespace. We didn't go to WordPress. And so we've coded from scratch a website that we think approximates as best we can the experience that we have done with the iBook. Okay, great, thanks. Um, could you walk us through the website a little bit? It's, sure, it's be happy to. Fascinating tool. Okay, great. Be Shall happy to. You, um, put the website. So if up? you want to put that up, uh, you'll okay, see that you. it carries its its first name, its full name here, Touching Home in China in Search of Missing Girlhoods. We now have four iBooks published. We published the iBook first, and we have three of our stories up on the website. The fourth one, Learning About Learning, will be up soon. How about we go to Abandoned Baby and we'll just go looking through that one for a second. Mm -hmm. So each mm -hmm. one obviously begins with its title and with a picture that epitomizes what it looks like. This is the opening of the website, so it gives an overview of our project, or of our six stories. So as you go down it, you will see that, again, it is driving you through with the text. It has visuals uh, that you can uh, take a look at. The first uh, interactive um, media comes here, which is Jenny's adoption papers. And if you play this, you will find out that the adoption papers are going to be read to you in Mandarin. Um, and you are going to see the papers morph into their English translation in front of you. Again, wow. you'll see that you can pull that up to go over your entire screen uh, by going just to the little um, thing at the bottom of it. So that takes you to the full screen. Oh. All right. And wow. that gives you the opportunity to play it. So if mm -hmm. we just go through this a little bit, you can scroll down. We do it as a long scroll. The mm -hmm. media elements come up. We have hyperlinks in it um, to various resources. So uh, we take you to um, very contemporary resources. 
uh, you can see that we're constantly giving the visual cue that this is really a cross-cultural story. We're giving you both the Mandarin as well as the English, constantly mm -hmm. reminding you that this is a cross-cultural experience. Okay. Uh, why don't we go and take a look at some of the other elements, I think, on it. Uh, we can look at, we've seen the girls page, which right. is um, where uh, you learn about the bios of each of the girls. Okay. Um, we can go, there's, yeah, that's that. If you want to, I don't know, if you click on one of those, you can see the bio that comes up. That's my daughter's bio. I mean, you can right. enlarge it again, but that's <laughs> what you get is just a snapshot that will remind you who the characters are. You can come back to that anytime you want to kind of refresh your mind in terms of which character you're talking about. Um, right. There's Jenny. So those are the two Americans and then they are surrounded by the six girls from their hometowns. Um, and so again, okay. um, if you get lost. The timeline I think is interesting. We can go to that for a moment. We developed this ourselves based on uh, primary sources, uh, meaning books and work that have been done by academic researchers. Okay. This is an effort to put the one-child policy into the context of China's overall population policies, starting from Mao and going to now. So it's from Mao to now. And it goes through uh, a long, um, you know, kind of year by year so that you get a sense of where the one-child policy fits into this. Okay. The and last thing I'd like to go to, Karen, if we have a moment, is the right. curriculum because this is really what's uh, the enduring part of this book. Um, I've written a book before back in the 90s. And, you know, books are out there for a while. I went on a national book tour and all of that, and lots is written about it. And then, you know, it kind of fades from view as we all move on. We want this to be, you know, an enduring storytelling project that can really be an avenue for learning for students. So with the found, uh, a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation, which does a lot of work in Asia, special projects grant, we have the funding and I'm now working with two curriculum writers who had worked with Facing History and ourselves to develop a curriculum and each curriculum is going to be designed for each of our six stories. You can see we have a drop down menu over to the left hand side of the screen and um, we have an overview of what we are trying to achieve with our curriculum, the kind of curriculum we are using, which is very deep inquiry. And then we have lessons that are going to be for each of our stories. So that's lesson one. Okay, fascinating. And I noticed just quickly before we leave the website, I noticed that in the story section, the fourth um, topic that you had was learning about learning or, or uh, a title similar to that. Could you could you touch on that a little bit? I think that's sure. Be happy to. Um, when you think about sixteen year old girls, which is the age that um, Jenny and Maya were when they went over there, and similarly aged girls in China, the predominant experience of all of their lives up to this point is going to be their school experience. Right. So in learning about learning, that's really where we zero in. We zero in on the conversations they had. It goes through everything from sex education. The Americans have it. The Chinese do not. Oh. So uh, that's, that's a point of discussion. To the Confucian principles of learning, we go into an awful lot of discussion about how Confucianism basically becomes the, way, the sort of principle, the foundation under which uh, these girls have uh, learned in school. So we have lots of videos. We have some videos from the classroom. Our guide for this, too, was the teacher in the middle school in what would have been my daughter's town had she grown up where she was abandoned. This is the woman, ironically, who would have been teaching my daughter English had my daughter grown up there. And so we learn about her life. She grew up in Shashi Town, and she talks about what school was like for her back when she was a child, what it's like now. We talk about the pressures that the Chinese students are under. We talk about the different routes that they take out of middle school. It's very different. At the age of 15 or 16, 
they have a very, very, very serious test which divides them at that point between whether they are eligible to go on to the academic high school or whether they must go on to a vocational program. And among our six girls, there were different routes that they ended up having to take. Um, so anyway, it's to me, it's, it's one of the most fascinating uh, explorations of this book because, of course, if you think about what's happening on the global level, uh, we are having debates in this country about testing. We are looking at Singapore and Shanghai and saying, my God, look how well they test. And then there's the debate about, well, they may test well, but are they doing the kind of critical thinking and creative learning that we need for the entrepreneurial world of today? And why are so many students now coming from China to go to universities in America and graduate schools and PhD programs? So what we're talking about in a very intimate, personal, storytelling way in a book is really what's being talked about on a global stage. Okay, wonderful. I mean, Thank how you. I'm excited, Karen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I've, I've been working in the field of education for 30 yeah. years and I quite follow, I've lived in Europe for the last 20 and so uh -huh. I follow other PISA reports and everybody's looking at Finland saying, oh, why can't we be like that? And, exactly, exactly. Um, well, these are, these are, you know, six or eight girls, you know, having this conversation. So what we feel is that this book, not only can it be read by adults and they'll learn something from it and I think enjoy the experiences of getting into the video and the interactive graphics, etc., but really for students in middle school, high school, and we think the early years of college, particularly community college where so many immigrants are today, right. that this story not only offers an, an intimate storytelling that gives you a sense that these characters are living lives like your own, but right. it also is designed for digital natives. It's mm -hmm. giving them these different routes of learning Right. through different kinds mm. of media and as Howard Gardner has informed us there are very different <laughs> ways of learning and yep. so yep. kids can find their way if they want to go to all the videos first in the story go to all the videos first. We have a question. Back to the right. um, we do have a question from one yep. of our listeners and um, I personally I totally relate to what you're saying about digital natives I'm an absolute digital immigrant but the question is, yeah. will there be a print book as well, or is this basically going to stay as a digital book? You know, I think it's going to stay as a digital book. It's so interesting. I explored this topic with um, some book agents on the phone about, oh my God, now two weeks ago. And I had previously been in a discussion with a more local publisher. And the bottom line is, we've talked about this a lot. Um, we really feel that this story is told extremely well uh, in this transmedia style. We do not feel that it would work as well as a print book. And so I would say right now the answer is no. I okay. love print books. I am not against print books. Um, but I think this one really um, has found its place. And okay. so we're going we're gonna to stick with doing it the best that we can in terms of storytelling uh, based on the models that we have as iBooks and as a website in which the stories exist in the same way with the curriculum there. Okay, thank you. And following from that, given your background in journalism and kind of your eye on the whole communication yeah. field on the planet, um, how do you see the future of digital books or a don't want to call it a digital book, transmedia projects like this, are they becoming, are, are we finding more and more transmedia projects of the sort that you're working on? Do you feel that there will be more? How do you feel that the relationship between the printed book and the transmedia book will play out in the next few years? I, I realize you don't have a crystal ball, but... I don't have a crystal ball, and it <laughs> is changing all the time. Uh, you know, I am a real proponent of independent bookstores where you can hold a book in your hand. And I love the fact that we're beginning to see, I think, the rebirth and sort of the real understanding that independent bookstores aren't going anywhere because people love them. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, I also believe that we're seeing much, much more experimentation in storytelling using a variety of media. We're seeing it 
in journalism today, which is where I kind of come from, it is really um, it, it's astonishing. And what what some of these really um, you know still well off uh, publishing places like the New York Times and the rest are doing with video storytelling, really transmedia storytelling. The use of interactive graphics for displays of data, etc., is really mind-boggling and wonderful. And for people who want to find it, there's plenty of it out there. And people who, you know, kind of relate to storytelling using this mix of media, um, I think there's going to be um, just an explosion of it. And I welcome that. At the same time at night, I like nothing better than to curl up with a book that I hold in my hands. So I think we're really living in a publishing era in which we can get the best of both worlds. Um, if I could just divert for one moment, one of the things that also makes this a transmedia project and plays on my skill set as a journalist is that we've developed an entire social media ecosystem in which this project lives. Every day I publish at least four to five items on a Facebook page. I've really developed a community. We're almost 2,000 people strong at this point. I've been doing it for the last year, about year and three months. Um, and every day we are able to get up contemporary coverage of issues in China that relate mainly to women and girls lives although there will be times when I will put things up that I just find fascinating about what's happening in China um, because after all women and girls are part of China's population so if there's something that I feel is really important to that we are getting enormous traction. We're getting a reach each week that's roughly 20,000. In our best weeks, wow. we're reaching over 30,000 people a week through this, through this Facebook page. We deal with adoption issues. We deal with China. So it's really a wonderful opportunity. We also have a Twitter feed devoted totally to this project. We also have a YouTube channel. And on our YouTube channel is every video that we put into our stories and books. We also put onto our YouTube channel, plus we have video that we don't use in our book that doesn't necessarily fit directly into the storytelling that we're doing. And so, oh my God, it's not there? Ah, that's sad. <laughs> well, okay. Well, anyway, we do have a YouTube channel. It's called Touching Home in China on YouTube. And uh, we have, I think, 25 videos up there now. And um, those are just there. People can come to it, see them. I'm so sorry. It looks like it's not available. You know, what, one of the things I learned from teaching digital natives was that, you know, you don't let that bother you. Like, yeah. Of course it crashed. You it know. bothers me. Okay, yeah, there we well, are. Yeah, so well, this, we're, we're, we're digital immigrants, so of course it's going to This is us. wonderful. So uh, what we have up here is all the videos that we have put into our stories, and then you will see there are some videos such as Do You Hear the Women Sing? Uh, because of contacts in China that I have through journalists, etc., um, we, ha we were invited, uh, if I can put it that way, and I asked my videographer in Beijing to go along on a flash mob of uh, oh, wow. some women activists <laughs> in the Beijing subway when they were protesting uh, harassment, sexual harassment, and trying to draw awareness to domestic violence on the subways. Now, this was in November of 2013. If anyone follows China, you will know that just a year later, five women activists were arrested simply for planning an activity like this, planning it, and held in detention for 41 days. They are still considered suspects. As far as I know, we are the only, quote, news organization that has a video showing what these actions look like. So, and we have video of artists in Beijing who have done pictures looking at one child policy. Um, so, we have extra videos, if you will, that ne haven't necessarily gone into our books about the girls, but okay. are there as well. Okay, great. One last quick question. Yep. Um, we have about a minute left. 
Um, what is, and this again from is from our audience. What should an author or a producer look out for in a contract on a project like this? Uh, I don't have a contract. I don't know. Okay. I don't okay. have an answer. We are self doing this. I don't have a contract with anyone to do this. Oh, um, I I have a verbal contract with people who work for me. The website designer. Uh, you know the person Julie who wor who works with me on this project. I pay them through funds we've raised through crowdfunding and also through the grants that we've gotten from foundations. But no one's contracting us to do it. There is no publisher. We are doing it ourselves, both as oh. iBooks and on the web. Okay, fantastic. And we is you and Julie. And Julie and obviously Natasha who does our website and mm -hmm. variety of other people that oh and our curriculum writers who are in Denver, Colorado. So uh, shout out to them. They are amazing. Okay, well thank you so much for joining us and describing this incredible new project, um, this this digital project that you've come up with, transmedia, not digital, sorry. Um, and <laughs> it it's been a wonderful conversation with you. Well, I have 10 million more questions, but we've well, run great. out of well, time. We'll have so. coffee, we'll have coffee, Karen, and answer them. Oh, good, so. that would, I would love that. <laughs> okay, um, and so our guest once again is Melissa Ledke, and she's the author of uh, Touching Home in China, a transmedia project. And coming up in our next two Ask the Expert Thursday broadcasts, next week we have O for the Love of Metadata with Angela Boll, the IBPA Executive Director. That's on the 17th of March. And then on the 24th, we have um, an interview with people from Bauhound Publishing, which should also be um, fascinating. And I look forward to all of that. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Bye. <laughs> Bye.